First of all, I want to say um, thank you to all the speakers, first of all, for, for, for coming here and, and, and taking your time to be with us and to share uh, your experience and your, your knowledge with us. And second of all, for the very, very interesting um, presentations. I think um, the, the idea of today was to really set the scene, and I think we've addressed it from a number of different uh, uh, angles uh, and got some very uh, um, valuable input in, uh, that will um, fuel our discussions tomorrow. Um, before uh, I open the questions to um, the, the audience, I want to say two things. Is first of all, if you have uh, a question, if I could get you to raise your hand and then somebody will come to you with the, the microphone. Our, uh, our translators are working very hard, but if we don't talk into the microphones, they can't hear what we're saying and then they can't do the translation. So before you get the microphone, you um, uh, raise your hand, We'll come to you, and then the second thing is, is if you could just start by saying who you are and where you're from. So if you're from a federation, or if you're an organizer in an event, or what, whatever, just to give us a little bit of identification so that we know where the question is coming from. Is that clear enough? Okay, do we have any questions that we want to start off with? I saw, and I know you had one there. You told me in the, in the break. Here, we, we have one here? I know he has one. <laughs> well, actually, I wanted you to, uh, to give it. Could you just say who you are and, and then... My name is Søren Henriksen. I'm the president of the Danish Athletic Association. Um, but before I'm saying that, I'm saying I haven't been in sport for 30 years. Uh, so coming into this for, for a year, a year and a half ago, I had more or less the same approach as running. How can we make a business case out of this? So my, but everybody here sitting, sitting here saying, well, this sounds great. But where are where the money? How do they come back into our, our sport? Because uh, the reason we are sitting here is that we have a sport behind us. Well, I just talked to some of you up there indicating that what we're trying to do in Denmark and will be doing in Denmark next year is that we're separating sport for the runners. Because we know that runners couldn't give it a damn. <laughs> about the sport. So we are giving them what they want. If they want a leech for the dog, they're going to give a leech for the dog. But we're going to give the money back to the sport. So what I'm asking, Lidl, Lidl, just in order to, to, to hear good, how much money are you actually ga uh, getting? I'm sitting next to, uh, to a Dane here, and he's making millions out of the same runs that you're doing in Denmark. So the question is, but how many are you giving, uh, giving back to the sport? I'm not talking about charity but to our sport. Kurt? We are, uh, I, I actually didn't mention the money, because then that, that would be the only thing that people uh, would remember. Uh, we make a couple of million, yes, for sure. And that was my point, that, that uh, that's of, of course one of the key bases for the, for the athletic club. On the other hand, I don't think it's the only thing the race is giving us, and that's why I try to focus on that. In terms of leaders and values, relation to the community, and many other things, which we tend to forget. Are you using the money for the athletic? Absolutely. Nick. Um, in our case, as I mentioned, we make about 5 million euros a year, and we put all of that back into sport, but not necessarily athletics. <laughs> Boo, as you say. Um, and we are particularly supporting uh, sports facilities in Great Britain. So, for instance, um, the new Olympic facilities in the Olympic Park for the 2012 Games, part of the use of those facilities post-2012 uh, will require changes, and we are going to pay for some of those changes, and that's to the Vela Park, to the Aquatic Centre, and also to the stadium. We also give money, we work with with the UK Athletics, our federation, to support endurance athletics. So we're putting money into that as well. But every single penny we make goes back into sport. 
So I think, uh, sorry, Kurt, go ahead. I could expand a bit to, to Søren's question there, saying that um, I mentioned that we have 2,500 officials during the race, which means that we can't, the athletic club can't bring those 2,500 alone to the place. First of all, we have a, we have a partner, the Orienteering Club I mentioned, but we also hire other local clubs. <laughs> So from that point of view, we give money back to a number of clubs on the island, which is one way also to relate to the community, that we become in general uh, important for the community in general. So if I, if I understand right, there are um, a, a number of ways that the money that is generated by these events goes back into sport in general, into the community in general, and some of it into into athletics specifically. Nick, I think you had a point. Uh, yes. when, when um, my po sorry. I just wanted to ask Martin about the if there's any sort of figures that he's aware of of the size of the the, the running market. But let's let's hear yeah, what Nick. But says. The point I wanted to make is that um, obviously we're talking here to an athletics audience, but actually the audience that we're talking to, the most important part of our audience, is the city because the we're closing London down for a day and that is the people we need to say thank you to. Those are the people who are putting in a thousand police officers, 1,200 uh, health professionals. So the money that we are generating, we're having to say, we're having to justify to the city that they're allowing us to disrupt their lives. So I think athletics has got to see itself as only part of the community which our events, and whether it's you or us, are servicing. And whether we're a health uh, charity or like um, the cancer research or in our case a general facilities uh, organization we are athletics has to see itself as part of that landscape not as the sole owners of the landscape Martin do you do you have are you aware of any figures that show what is the total size of the market well, the big problem, of course, is that uh, so many different definitions of running are used that it is very difficult, almost impossible, to um, to uh, duplicate all, uh, to, to to count all the uh, percentages of each country. Um, but if you take as a principle, for example, that a runner is someone who takes part in running, jogging or athletics at least once a month, then I think uh, uh, you can see that in most countries the percentage of the total population is somewhere between 5 and 10 percent. Uh, I think I, I, uh, also looking <laughs> at uh, figures from Runner's World, is that a good guess? Uh, do you Yes, I, th I think we, we consider sorry we consider it to be about um, yeah about eight percent of the market, and I guess our sector of it is probably less than five percent. The, the market that we see as the opportunity for us, um, we we would consider to be in the UK about a million and a half runners. Those that's the market that we would target and think we can sell a magazine to. But beyond that, yeah, there, there's probably as many again and more that we don't consider part of our target group. Is there any um, indication of the size in financial terms? You've talked about terms of the percentage of the population, but how about in, in financial terms? I don't have uh, that figures, but... Um, I, I can tell you a little bit about the economic impact of major races because uh, people like ourselves, Berlin, New York, we do economic impact studies every year uh, or every so often and in our case our last economic impact survey showed that the race uh, added to the economy of, uh, of Great Britain over 100 million euros a year. And that's because runners are spending quite a bit of money throughout the year. It's not just about the money they spend when they spend on their hotels and their travel to the race. It's because they do join gyms or they do join running clubs and they do buy uh, shoes, etc. And so the total market that just from that one event is 100 million euros a year. Okay. Uh, we'll go to Soren to, to, to follow up, and then we'll go to Jeff after that. Jeff, wait. <laughs> the money can be divided into a lot of different categories. Uh, but in Denmark, we just took a simple, uh, simple guess. There are approximately 800,000 that runs once a week. Once, they're probably buying one pair of shoes a year. 
If we can get 10% of that market, we have enough. <laughs> Over here, Jeff, and then we'll come back thereafter. Hi, uh, Jeff Whiteman. I'm uh, going to be heading up the new road running division of uh, British Athletics. And the first thing I wanted to say was uh, anti-disestablishmentarianism and then onomatopoeia, just to say hello to the translators there. <laughs> Um, one of the things that governing bodies potentially could do, given that they're objective and neutral as regards most road races, is, is what Sean's doing at the IWF, and that is grade and categorise and tier races with a view perhaps to a Grand Prix in the end. But you've almost touched upon the first difficulty that you have there, and I wonder if you and Steve and Nick have got any thoughts on the solution, that no race wants to be seen as second best. So as soon as you start to categorise, you're going to get into issues of either making the tier of those races that you do categorise very small, or that people will just opt out or choose not, not to be graded. Have you, have you any thoughts on that? I think the answer is quite simple, that once you've filled your top tier and you've attracted a second tier who are aspiring to be the first tier, then you're, you're, gonna, you're putting people up from the top. I mean, we, we see people who say, well, if we can't be gold, we don't want to be there. So, fine, don't be there. But they'll come back next year and they will fill the criteria because they want to be there. There are races that are realistic and say, well, we cannot fill the criteria. We, we, we cannot get international television broadcasting, for example. But they're very happy to be a silver tier race. And we've, we've got races that are possibly younger, they have less money, whatever. And again, they're realistic. They say, but hang on a sec, we are now part of an international calendar. Because if you're not a labelled race, you're not in our calendar. Um, and that is important for a lot of races. As I said earlier, they can go to their sponsors, they can go to their national governing body and say, well, you know, we fill the criteria for this, talk to us. The sponsors will talk to them, so uh, the, the, value, the value is there. This is a new project, as you know. Um, we issued the first labels in 2008. Um, as I was saying earlier with Hanjo, I think that this is something that we will be looking at again differently in the next three to five years. It's not, it's not a day one to day two. Um, it's there. We're, th we're there for the duration as a, as a world governing body, as the national governing bodies are. Um, we're building bridges. Once we build the bridges, we'll build the traffic. Okay, we had another question in the back there. Oh, sorry, Nick, I didn't mean to cut you off there. <laughs> I was just going to say, taking another example from a different sport, which is in cycling, um, uh, and especially what's happened, for instance, in New Zealand some years ago, there were uh, some accidents on cycle races on the roads. And the Federation set s basic standards, and they set a tier standards. But th what happened was, because of the accidents that happened on the road, the police started to say, unless you have the very basic standard at the least, then we are not going to permit you on the roads. And I, th as we get more and more health and safety conscious uh, from the public authorities, <coughs> that's when we will start to see minimum standards apply, and where a label from a Federation has a real role to play for the future. Okay, there was a question in the back there. Yeah, uh, hi, I'm Alistair Curry, the manager of the Jog Scotland programme, which is uh, part of Scottish Athletics. Uh, we are possibly one of the few uh, federations who actually do look at uh, running as an activity for uh, health and well-being, and we, we've been running this, the programme for seven years. Uh, my question uh, is really to... Uh, John Michelle, but anyone else who wants to chip in, uh, feel free. Uh, I understand the scientific rationale behind uh, the targets from the WHO on uh, physical activity recommendations for adults and for uh, children, uh, but I want to uh, ask you how achievable and realistic do you think they are for the general population, the 30 minutes and the 60 minutes? But uh, before you answer the question, can I, can I just ask around, can we do a quick show of hands to see how many people in this room will be physically active 30 minutes on most days of this week? <laughs> okay, 
That's not too bad, but probably about 40% is my guess on that. And we're aiming for figures around 70% in the UK if the figures uh, from London 2012 are to be believed. So if an audience here who are uh, involved in sport can't achieve it, how realistic is it for the rest of the population? So I think it's achievable. Uh, as you can see, the majority uh, practice still uh, 30 minutes a day. It's not sport. It's physical activity. That's quite different because uh, you, you can, uh, for example, uh, in Paris, we have uh, the, what we call now the Vélib. Vélib, uh, you can uh, rent for almost free a bike and uh, to go where, where you want in Paris. That we have now 20,000 uh, bikes for that. That is uh, activity. And every morning when I go to, to, to my job, I take a bike and uh, I back during uh, 10 or 15 minutes and 10 minutes in the morning 10 minutes in the evening and uh, I have to, to walk 10 minutes uh, during the day and it's uh, it's all so it's not so difficult but we have to change uh, the social norms of uh, people and that's why we try to to work with families and to encourage the, the physical activity within the families uh, uh, parents and children Okay. Can I add something sure. to that? There's also a discussion now in the uh, scientific literature about what is uh, more effective, uh, either five times a week, 30, th 30 minutes a day uh, in a moderate sense or uh, in a more intense way Three, three times a week, one hour. Um, and, uh, well, the conclusions are not easy to draw from that discussion, but I think that, for example, with respect to children and, and youngsters, the, 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 the recommendation could be a bit different in that respect. Yes, for children it's about uh, 60 minutes a day, uh, but it depends what is your goal. If you want to, to wait uh, gain, uh, to, <laughs> to lose weight, yes. sorry, uh, it's, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. you, you need uh, at least uh, 90 minutes a day. Uh, uh, to, to, uh, and, the, and I agree with you, it's quite impossible to do that. But if you'd like to, to have a good uh, cardiovascular function, uh, 30 minutes is uh, it's enough. If you like to prevent uh, cancer, uh, it's enough. Okay. We have another question over here, but before we, we go to that question, I just need to say that Nick uh, has uh, kindly joined us today, but he, as he said, he has a big board meeting tomorrow. He has a flight that's leaving, so at, at some point Nick will have to leave us and um, stay as long as you like, but uh, don't miss your plane. So, <laughs> over there. <laughs> Okay, my name is uh, Nils Jostein, and I'm uh, the race director of uh, Oslo Marathon, and also um, the president of the organizing club be, uh, behind the Oslo Marathon. And I do also have the same commercial background as Kurt. We are coming from the same company, actually. From, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I do have a question for, I guess it's Kurt and, uh, and Nick. Nick, you mentioned you have 7,500 volunteers, and Kurt, you had 2,500, if I remember correctly. How do you recruit so many people for uh, an event like that and what do you do for them? I mean, uh, do you pay them or uh, do you just give them a t-shirt uh, saying crew? Uh, and do you get them together sometime the rest of the year or do you only bring them together on the race day? Um, I don't know how to answer short on that one. Uh, one important factor is that this race is a part of the local community. It's in, that means it's some sort of a prestige for many to become a part of it. So if you have a t-shirt and you are showing your neighbors you have been a part of the race during that weekend when the city is almost closed for, for, uh, uh, for other car drivers, etc. You are a part of something. Um, then of course when you come to the key, the key um, leaders in the race organization, of which you have in between 50 and 100, of course, with them, they are the part of the organization. We have to have regular planning meetings and things with them, and they have a special party and stuff like that. But um, besides that, their clubs, different clubs, are, are getting money. No one is paid uh, anything on top of that. 
Um, our approach recognises how difficult it is to try and attract 7,500 volunteers every year and therefore we do not try to do that. What we do is we try and uh, attract and keep 75 people because what we do is we uh, go for groups. So we go for companies, sports clubs, universities, and we go to uh, a company and we say, deliver us 100 volunteers. Or we say to a sports club or a, a youth group, 100 volunteers. That way we're only ever having to deal with a maximum of 75 people. And we're training those 75 people. We're meeting with them. And now the drivers about why they want to get involved will differ if it's a company or if it's a, a, a sports club. But generally for a company, most big Big companies in Britain have a, have a community support program, a CSR program, uh, like your former company, where they require their employees to give a certain number of days to the community. And volunteering at the London Marathon can count as one of those days. And depending on your point of view, it's a lot better to volunteer at the London Marathon than maybe go and clean an old person's garden or whatever else it may be under your CSR program. Or my garden, for that matter. Oh, the same thing, I'm an old person. Uh, <laughs> um, for, for a running clubs, uh, yes, they may be more interested if we give them an entry because of how difficult it is to get an entry. And what we find is that we keep those 75 people year in, year out. There's very little turnover indeed. And in fact, currently we have waiting lists of, of groups wanting to come volunteer at the London Marathon. And no, they don't want to go to Oslo. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Yep. Yes, yeah, my name is Paco Borao. I'm here to represent the Spanish Federation and at the same time I race director for the Valencia Marathon enough. So I think that uh, I came here and I see that the audience is uh, based upon race organizers and uh, or events organizers and people representing federations. So I think that uh, the, the running has two different, um, I would say, worlds. One world is the fun race and the other one is the competitive race. So I think that for the fun race it is true that we all agree that it is good for health, we are promoting, uh, etc. And we have to, to do everything we do for the fun race, which is a very good thing to do and the base for the competitive one. But I, I think also that the competitive one has a governing body, which is the IAAF and the national federations. So I think we have a dilemma and we have something to work on. And in Spain we are doing that, organizers and the federation, in order to find out a balance between races and events and federations in order to find out, let's say, a good balance to have uh, our runners ensure, uh, control, and, uh, and then everybody likes to have a, a good, uh, let's say, a diploma with a, a federation, blah, 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 you got uh, next time, etc. And I think that the, the, the federation de deserves some kind of help from the events because uh, at this point in time the money comes from the events. Did you, did you have a specific question that you, that you wanted no, to ask? No, I think that Sean Wallace and, uh, and maybe Nick, who is uh, the, 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 the biggest event, uh, uh, should maybe uh, say something about the big money made by, uh, let's say, a big event and the non-charge made by the IAAF to the events. So, so th there is something wrong here. Martin? An uh, interesting uh, observation in this respect could also be that this is also the power of running. That means that the combination of having fun and uh, being a recreational runner and running together with the absolute world class athletes, uh, I don't know of any other sport in which uh, I myself 
could participate in a run or in a race uh, in which also, for example, Gabriel Solossi participated. I think he was already he already finished before I had, and I still had to start. But that's a different uh, uh, matter. Uh, also, uh, cycling or, or any sport you 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 think about uh, doesn't have this uh, this 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 power of, of running to combine a lead sport and and a sport for all in in the one and the same race for for the audience uh, in, down in the streets of of your city, the city where you live in it's really a, a remarkable aspect of running i think oh, the only thing is how we how we help the federations which are i mean uh, the national federation the, the um, let's say from our events then this is something to to be find out yet I think it's not it's not clear at this point in time. It I mean, I think I think that is the part of the reason why we're here, Paco, is is to to look at ways in which the federations can help the races, and not act as tax inspectors, um, and also that reciprocally, the races can can help the federations. Uh, I mentioned in my speech about a quid pro quo. Well, this could be, for example, that uh, many races are already doing it. They are providing youth programs. They are providing programs for children. London Marathon is a very specific case because it is a charity, whereas most races are not charities. In your case, you're, you're organised by a club. Um, but many of the races are private commercial entities that have grown out of their own sweat, money out of their pockets, the Federation has to also give something to the races, then, then, they, then you can start talking about a trade-off. Um, it, can't, it can't be one way. I think that's the, that's the important thing. Thank you. And another aspect, uh, I think, also is to ask oneself, what is the sport? What is athletics? Is the federation something different from from the clubs? In in the countries where we have a club system, like we have in Scandinavia at least, and in some other Western European countries as well, for me, I mean, the the sport activity take take place locally, managed by the clubs. Then we have a federation, whose role is to support the clubs and send out the national team. And again, uh, as Nick was very clearly selling before, I mean, the background, I think, in, uh, at least in Scandinavia, is that these races has developed in spite of the Federation. And, and then as long as it's, it's organized and, and owned like we have in Scandinavia by the clubs, I think it's, the dilemma is almost zero from that point of view. <laughs> <laughs>